So turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 20. And, you know, when I look at these scriptures here, it's hard to imagine what this world's going to be like when Jesus Christ returns. Um, no more wars, no more violence. Uh, Russia and China and Iran will be on their best behave behavior. The uh, United States will stop getting involved in all these conflicts all over the world. Every nation will stop fighting and warring, and every tribe will stop fighting and warring. It's hard to imagine. I mean, there'll be no more hunger, no more disease. Um, again, it's hard to imagine today with the way things are in the world around us, but no more pollution, no more corporate greed, no more political greed. Uh, it's hard to imagine. I mean, can you imagine a world where Jesus Christ himself will rule and reign uh, perfectly because he is perfect and he alone will rule and reign with a rod of iron? Well, not alone because he says we will rule and reign with him. But can you picture a world that is no longer in rebellion against God. Everybody that, you know, survives the Great Tribulation will go into the millennial reign. Jesus will rule and reign over them, and everyone will turn to the Lord. Well, most everyone. Uh, we'll get to that later. But it's going to be a time where the lion and the lamb and the wolf and the lamb and, you know, everybody's going to get along. It's going to be glorious. As we've seen the Great Tribulation, though, it is a time of God's wrath and judgment. We saw last time Jesus Christ coming back from heaven to earth, and we come back with him, and he brings an end to <clears throat> basically the annihilation of planet earth. It's on the brink of total destruction when he returns, and he will you know, destroy his enemies with a sharp two-edged sword, the living powerful word of God. All he has to do is speak the word, and his enemies will be destroyed. And then we saw that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. And they will be the first inhabitants of the lake of fire, and they'll be the only inhabitants for a thousand years. And then at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, Satan will be let loose for a season, a very short time we'll see in a moment. He will tempt those who are in their natural bodies still on planet Earth. And many will join in his rebellion against God, but they're quickly put down. And then we have the great white throne judgment, Satan, all the, you know, unbelievers throughout history will go before the great white throne and into the lake of fire. And so we are looking at some amazing things here in the book of Revelation. Um when he destroys all those who worship the Antichrist, he will receive the mark of the beast upon their right hand or forehead. Uh, he'll deliver all the people that survived the Great Tribulation, and they will go into the, the millennial reign in their natural bodies. But the primary group that's going to be saved when Christ returns will be the Jewish people. You know, they will receive the Lord. They will see him. Zechariah 12.10 tells us that they will mourn over him as a mother mourns for her only son. They'll ask, where did you receive these wounds in your hands? He says, in the house of my friends. And, and all the Jews who are alive that survived because God has his hand of protection on them for the great tribulation, they will turn to Christ. They will receive him as their long-awaited Messiah. And that's going to be amazing. So Jesus warns them what's going to happen. He says this in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16. This is where he speaks to the Jews and he, he exhorts them to escape into the wilderness. And, the, you know, it's after they see the Antichrist. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. So that's when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple, says, worship me, I'm God. That, that's halfway through the seven-year Great Tribulation. It's three and a half years in because we're told very clearly in the book of Daniel and also in Revelation that after that event, there's 1,260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, three and a half years. That, that all equals three and a half years until Christ returns. And so we know the day and hour of his return. It's three and a half years after the abomination of desolation. So then Jesus says, when you see this, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So again, 
It's the Antichrist going into the rebuilt, rebuilt temple saying, worship me, I'm God. The Jews are to realize that is not our God. He is not our Messiah. And that's when they're told to flee. And so we, we see they flee into the wilderness. Uh, personally, I believe they go to Petra. Not everybody, only a third of all the Jews at that time will get saved. A third of the Jews will reject the lies of the Antichrist. Two-thirds will be destroyed by the Antichrist. Where do we get that? Well, it's in Zechariah 13, verses 8 to 9. It says, It shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, this is talking about the great tribulation, will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. And then here's the good news for these Jews. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is my God. And so this glorious day of salvation for the remnant Jews will happen when Christ returns at his second coming. Uh, the Apostle Paul gives us this wonderful truth as well in Romans 11, starting in verse 25. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. And so uh, Romans 9, 10, 11, it's all about the Jews and how they were, you know, grafted, or we've been grafted in, but they've been cut off, and yet they can be regrafted in. And so he says, I desire, brethren, that you should, not, uh, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I don't desire that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own uh, opinion. The blindness in part has happened to Israel, and we see that even today, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So, and so all Israel will be saved. Again, those who survive the Great Tribulation. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away the ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Uh, again, what a wonderful day that will be when the surviving Jews recognize Jesus is and always has been their Messiah. Um, I mentioned it before, uh, back in 2010 when we were in Israel, our tour guide, who's amazing, um, he, uh, you know, you think he's a believer, you know, I mean, he knows the Old Testament, New Testament, inside and out. I mean, he could quote from almost any passage. You say, well, you know, where is this? And he'll, he knows. So I finally, at the end of our trip, you know, because I knew he wasn't a believer, I said, what's it going to take for you to believe that Jesus is your Messiah? And he says, well, when the Messiah comes, I'll say, I'll ask him, is this your first or your second time here? And I said, you know, it's going to be too late. My sister just got back from Israel, and she put together a tour, uh, a group down in East Texas, and he was their tour guide this time. And it sounds like he is a believer now. He's been in ministry with uh, Calvary Chapel in uh, somewhere out there in Marietta area. He's been in close contact with one of the pastors there. And so she was convinced that he has come to know the Lord. So if that's true, I hope so, you know, that would be awesome because he will recognize Jesus as Messiah at the rapture. He won't have to wait till the second coming because he'll be coming, going up with us if he's truly born again. So these Jews here in uh, the book of Revelation that we see in Romans, they will enter into the millennial reign of Christ in their natural bodies. Uh, they, along with the other survivors of the Great Tribulation, will begin to repopulate the world during that thousand-year reign of Christ. And so we pick up here in chapter uh, 20. We'll pick up in verse 1. Uh, again, we left off with Christ coming at his, you know, at his second coming. And as soon as Jesus wipes out the enemies on the earth... The Antichrist, we saw the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire, and they will be in torment for eternity. <clears throat> but after the thousand-year reign of Christ, uh, they'll be joined by Satan and all those who have rebelled against the Lord. So, look at verse twenty or chapter 20, verse 1. John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. 
he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And so right after the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire, we see Satan here, the devil. I mean, it's very clear who this is. He gets bound with a great chain and will spend a thousand years in the bottomless pit. That must be one great chain. You know, you're not going to find this chain at Home Depot or Lowe's. You know, this is a chain that will bind Satan for 1,000 years. A few things to take note of in this section. First, it shows us that Satan is no match for God. Um, this angel isn't even named. You, you know, I've seen some commentaries where they kind of joke about the fact that, you know, it's just a little run-of-the-mill angel God has to bind Satan and, you know, put him in the bottomless pit. His name could be Ralph. You know, we don't know, or Bill. I mean, just some random angel God uses, and he unlocks the door to the bottomless pit here, and that's where Satan will spend 1,000 years. Again, that's the entire millennial reign of Christ, his, you know, kingdom of God on earth. And so that's one of the reasons the kingdom of God is going to be so amazing. There'll be no satanic influence. He'll be locked away. There won't be any demons at this point hassling us. It's just Jesus ruling and reigning. And we'll be in our resurrection bodies ruling and reigning with him. And then all those in their natural bodies, we will be overseeing this world for a thousand years. And it's going to be glorious beyond our comprehension. And this also shows us that Satan does not even come close to being an equal counterpart to Jesus. Jesus is the creator of all things, including Lucifer. He created all the angels. He created the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Um, he, we're told in uh, John 1, 1 through 3, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and that nothing has come into being except through Him. I mean, He created it all. He is the one who spoke all things into existence. But, as you know, Lucifer rebelled against the Lord. He was kicked out of heaven. We saw back in chapter 12, he took a third of the angels with him in his rebellion. So the third of the angels now we know as demons. Two-thirds are God's holy angels. And so the demons or what are hassling people for the most part. Uh, I've never seen Satan face to face, but I'm sure we've all encountered various demons trying to tempt us and discourage us and, you know, trying to get us to steal, kill, and destroy ourselves over the years. And so um, the point is don't ever put Jesus Christ and Satan on the same playing field. Uh, Jesus is infinitely greater than Satan. Not, a, not even close. You know, so often we think, oh, no, the devil. And it's like, oh, yeah, Jesus, you know, infinitely greater than anything Satan could ever do to us. So here we see this unnamed angel. He binds him with a great chain. And again, I think this is so appropriate because think of all the chains that Satan has bound up people with in this world. You know, people have been bound up in all kinds of things. Legalism. False doctrines, false religions. Uh, people have been bound up with all types of sin, you name it. I mean, they've been bound up in sin of, you know, deceitfulness of riches, drugs, alcohol, everything out there. And so for a thousand years, Satan will be bound up. Now, even as this angel has a key that opens up the bottomless pit, Jesus has also given us a key. Uh, he mentions it to Peter. Um, and that key is simply the gospel. You know, he's given us the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who will believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's what sets captives free that are bound up by these chains that the enemy has placed upon them. You know, we have the key that will unlock those chains and set them free when they come to Jesus Christ. So we just need to get the gospel out there. And we know that key, <clears throat> the gospel, can set any captive free. 
from anything that has them in bondage. Um, I mean, the bottom line is sin. Sin is the worst prison there is. Without Jesus, you were bound up in sin, and, and you're heading to the lake of fire unless Jesus Christ sets you free. But John chapter 8, starting in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin <clears throat> is a slave of sin. Well, who's committed sin? Every one of us, every single person has a sin nature, and we all commit sin. And so a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son, Jesus, makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And so if Satan has you in any type of bondage this morning, then you need to turn it over to Jesus and he'll set you free. He's the only one that can. Uh, who the Son makes free is free indeed, he says. But how wonderful it'll be when Satan is taken out of commission for a thousand years, but at the same time, how glorious it is to know that um, he's been taken out of commission in my life in so many ways, in so many areas. He's been taken out of your life, decommissioned, so to speak. I mean, I was once a slave of Satan, but Jesus purchased me. And that was his spotless blood. And so when you um, are set free from being a slave of sin, you become a bond slave of Jesus Christ. You know, like Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. I mean, we all serve someone. It's either Satan or Jesus. Bottom line. There, there's no, well, I'm indifferent. No, it doesn't matter. Then you're bound up by Satan. So we were once Satan's slaves, but Jesus purchased us with his blood. Colossians 1.13 and 14 says it like this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, praise the Lord, and he has conveyed us, that means he's transferred us, into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption. So that means you've been purchased with a price, and that price was through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Paul will go on to say in Colossians 2, 14 and 15 that on the cross, Jesus, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, those that's the demonic realm, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, in, in the cross. That's where he defeated Satan. Satan thought he had Jesus defeated. Oh, good. He's dead. I win until the resurrection. And he's like, uh-oh. And it was toast. He was, it was done. So even though we look forward to that day when Satan will be taken out of commission, thrown into the bottomless pit like we see here, Again, we praise the Lord today because he has been decommissioned in our lives. You know, greater is he, don't ever forget 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you, that's Jesus, than he that's in the world, Satan. So we don't have to walk around in fear, oh no, what's he going to do to me? No, greater is he that's in you. If you're born again, you have Jesus living in you. The Father lives in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Uh, we're safe and secure in the Lord. God's holy angels outnumber the demons two to one. So we don't have to walk in fear, but that's what Satan tries to do. That's all he can do for, to us is try to get us to worry and fear about what's going on around us. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So look at verse 3. This unknown, unnamed, not unknown to God, obviously, no, this unnamed deem, uh, angel binds Satan with the chain, throws him in the bottomless pit, and it says in verse 3, And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. In every way he can be shut up. <laughs> shut your mouth. Shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. So again, in this one verse, there's a lot of stuff in here. And we'll look at this, you know, real quickly here. But first we see that Satan is cast into 
the bottomless pit. It was back in chapter 9 we saw that Satan had a key to this bottomless pit, and when he opened it, all these demon critters came flying out of there, and they tormented people during the Great Tribulation. That was the fifth trumpet judgment. Remember, it says these creatures looked like locusts, but they had stings like scorpions, and they tormented everybody on planet Earth except for the 144,000 for five months. Uh, just brutal. The only ones not affected were the ones that God sealed, those 144,000 Jews who had the seal of God, it says, on their foreheads. That seal is very important. Um, the, the bottomless pit is also called the shaft of the abyss. The, the Greek word here is abusos. It's the same place, remember when Jesus came uh, to the Gadarene he was demon-possessed. He you know, goes across the Sea of Galilee, and he's met by this guy just screaming and yelling and cutting himself. And Jesus says, what's your name? And he says, Legion. And it says, for there were many demons in him. And so then Jesus, uh, well, the demons say, you know, don't send us into the abyss. Same word as this, the bottomless pit. And he says, okay. And he let them go into the 2,000 pigs. They run down that steep embankment, and they drown in the Sea of Galilee. So that's the same place, the shaft of the abyss or the bottomless pit. So notice also that this angel sets a seal on him. In other words, Satan will be sealed shut in prison, uh, he won't able, uh, be able to break this seal for a thousand years. He won't be able to break it at all, but he, he's going to be in there sealed for 1,000 years. And again, this is another example of the superiority of Jesus over Satan. Remember when uh, you know, um, Joseph Arimathea, he asked Pontius Pilate for the body of Jesus, and they, he says, okay, you can have him, and they put him in the tomb, and then Pilate says that he sets a seal upon the tomb and all the guards that are there to protect the tomb from being broken into. Well, again, third day, that Sunday morning, seal's broken. For, you know, guards can stop it. Seal's broken, tomb's rolled away. Jesus raises up. He's in his glorified body. But the point is, there's no way Satan can break this seal just like nobody can stop Jesus and seal him away, only Jesus Christ has the power to break any seal. And um, the important thing for you and me as believers is we have the same seal of God upon our lives. When we got saved, he put his seal of promise upon us, which is the Holy Spirit. A couple verses, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, in him, in Jesus, you also trusted. When was that you trusted? Well, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you weren't ever saved. I know we were all chosen before the foundation of the world, but you weren't saved and sealed until that very moment. You heard the gospel. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. It says, in whom also having believed, what must I do to be saved? Well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. So you have to believe. And when we did, at that moment, it says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And so as believers and followers of Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit no one can break that seal, not even Satan. If Satan himself appeared right now and stood here, he couldn't break that seal. He has no power over my life. Jesus is the final authority in my life. There's other verses that talk about the seal. Um, you can write them down. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Uh, he says pretty much the same thing in 2 Corinthians one. Uh, 21 and 22. So 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, we have that seal of God upon us, the Holy Spirit. Now notice why, it, said, it tells us why he is locked up in this bottomless pit for a thousand years. Again, verse 3, so that he should deceive the nations no more. That gives us a clue as to what his program is, deception. Satan is the master deceiver. 
that, that's his most powerful weapon. And the most powerful weapon we have in coming against Satan's deception is God's word. God's word is a sharp two-edged sword. God's word is what we use when Satan tries to deceive us with his lies. We stand upon the truth of God's word. We hold fast to the truth of God's word. This is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Just like when he came and tempted Jesus. Jesus pulls out the sword of the spirit. It is written. It is written. It is written. And then Satan had to leave him. And so he will leave us because he cannot break that seal and we are standing upon the truth of God's word. But what a deceiver he has been. Again, very, very subtle. I mean, you have God creating Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They're perfect. They don't even have any sin. And yet he comes as the serpent, the deceiver, and he tricks them. Oh, did God really say, again, getting them to doubt God's word, and, oh, you won't die. Surely you won't die if you eat that forbidden fruit. And he deceives them, and they give in to that lie, and that's when sin entered the world. But what a deceiver he has been. He has deceived human beings throughout the centuries to believe all kinds of lies. God is dead. <laughs> Jesus doesn't love you. Jesus can't save somebody like you. You've sinned too much. I mean, those are all lies. But Jesus Christ is the one who says, no, I do love you. I demonstrated my love for you. I died on the cross for you, for your sins. So we stand upon the truth of God's word. Remember, as Jesus prayed in the, the garden, he prayed to the Father in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, Satan's greatest deception of all was when he deceived himself into thinking, I can be like God. I mean, that's how deceptive he is. He's totally self-deceived. And he knows what happened because of his deception. He got kicked out of heaven. This is where we read about it in Isaiah 14. Look at these verses starting in verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, this is the five I wills that Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Here's the kicker here. I will be like the Most High. Here's God's response to Satan's pride. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And it's here in Revelation 20. We see right here he's brought down to the lowest depths of the pit, the bottomless pit. And this is where he will stand, spend a thousand years and then ultimately in the lake of fire. Notice uh, it says at the end of verse 3 that Satan will be released for a little while after the thousand years of Christ's reign is finished. Now, we'll see this in greater detail further into this chapter. We're not going to get there this morning. But when he's released, it's to tempt those in their natural bodies who live throughout the thousand-year reign of Christ. He'll tempt them to rebel against God. And he'll be successful. He'll get a bunch of people to rebel. And yet God will wipe them out very quickly. It's not a, it's not a big battle. It just says, God, that's it. Well, that's my translation of what we'll read, but it just, and that's it. I mean, very, it's very quick. In fact, it says here, for a little while, uh, the Greek words for little while is micros, chronos. That just means a very, very tiny amount of time. So Satan's not, when he's let out, he's not going to just be around for thousands and thousands of years doing his thing again. It's just for a very, very short time, micros, chronos. And then once he's wiped out for good, he's cast into the lake of fire, and he'll end up there forever and ever, as we'll see later on. So he'll be let loose for a little while. So don't think, oh, no, he's back. It's just for a very short time. And it's interesting because, you know, you think after a thousand years, Jesus is ruling and reigning on planet Earth. 
in his resurrection body. He's there. Everybody's seeing and we'll you know, see verses where he, you know, everybody's flowing into Jerusalem, flooding there to hear him speak, to hear Jesus teach. I mean, it's just going to be glorious. And he's ruling and reigning. The planet Earth is like the Garden of Eden all over. After the Great Tribulation, it's devastated, but then he's going to turn it into this beautiful paradise. And you'd think after a thousand years of this, people would be like, oh, Jesus, you're amazing. You're awesome. And Satan's let loose. Let me show you a better way. And people will follow him. Not everybody, obviously, but it'll be a large army, it says, that will follow him. Unbelievable. Well, look at verse 4. It says, and I saw thrones. So here's the Apostle John. He's up there. He's witnessing all this. And he says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Remember the infamous 666, back in chapter 13, verse 18, 17 and 18. It says, And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now that part of verse 5 I believe should be in parentheses, as we'll see in a moment. He says, This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, for uh, or over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Again, there's a lot of information packed in these verses. But the first thing we see here is that there are two distinct groups of people mentioned here in verse 4. Look at verse 4 again. The first group John sees are those who are seated upon thrones, and judgment was committed to them. Who is that? Well, that's you and me. That's the bride of Christ. That's the body of Christ. How do we know that? Because of what we've already seen in the book of Revelation. Uh, Jesus told the overcomers within the church of Thyatira, this is Revelation 2.26, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. So we'll be ruling and reigning with Jesus in our resurrection bodies. To the overcomers in the church of Laodicea, chapter 3, verse 21 this is right after Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come in and him, and I'll dine with him and he with me. And then he says here, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And so we see here that we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, to the, the bride of Christ, to the believers. Do you not know that the saints, speaking of us, will judge the world? This is during the millennial reign of Christ. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? I mean, he's talking about suing our brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't do that. And so this is a glorious privilege that God will entrust to us when Jesus establishes the kingdom of God on earth. Now, in the meantime, before we're given our glorified resurrection bodies, we need to make sure that we're lead, you know, living our lives in such a way, leading our families, being a blessing to those around us in the Jesus style of leadership. Some of you remember Gail Irwin, and he wrote a book called The Jesus Style. And it's a great book because it's very simple. This is how we should lead. And it's just a Jesus style of leadership, and it begins by being a servant leader, not lording it over others. You know, this is what we see in what Jesus tells us throughout the, the Gospels. We, we do that by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit according to the truth of God's Word. You know, we're being examples to those around us. And so this first group mentioned in verse 4 here is us. Now, he mentions a second group. It should be obvious who this second group is in verse 4. They are the tribulation saints. Notice again, it says they were beheaded for their faith in Christ during the great tribulation. They get saved during the great tribulation. The rapture's taking place. We're gone. 
And for seven years, the Antichrist is going to be on the scene. And yet many, many from every tribe, tongue, nation, people, we've seen this many times throughout the book of Revelation, during that time frame, many, many people are going to turn to Christ for salvation. They will reject the mandatory 666 because Satan will try to get everybody to take that jab, the 666. And if you don't, you're going to be put to death. So most of these that he's referring to here have been put to death because of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. As we've seen in the book of Revelation, multitudes. Uh, back in chapter, uh, I think it was 7, it says it was an innumerable number. You know, it was so many people from all these different tribes and uh, tongues all over the world coming to Christ. And yet because of their faith in Jesus, they'll be put to death and they refused to, as it mentions here, they did not worship the Antichrist. They did not take his mark, the mark of the beast. And yet they were willing to face the consequences of their actions, which was death. There's so many things going on in the world around us today. There's a lot of places where Christians are told you cannot say these things. And they'll tell you, you cannot talk about these things. It's like, well, the Bible talks about you. Oh, that's hate speech. Like, well, I got to obey God rather than men. I mean, they told John and Peter, you know, stop telling everybody in Jerusalem about Jesus. Uh, whether it's right in the sight of you to do what God tells us, uh, it's up to you to decide. But we're not going to deny the Lord. You know, we're going to stand on the truth of God's word. We are going to proclaim what Jesus told us to proclaim. We must obey God rather than men. Um, to me, this is one of the greatest pictures of God's grace in the Bible. These people, unbelievers, because we've talked to them, we've witnessed to them, family members, friends, neighbors, and they get left behind at the rapture. And yet, because of, hopefully, our godly witness, they'll realize those crazy Christians were right. I should have believed them. And so they know what's coming, and so they'll resist the Antichrist. Many will turn to Jesus Christ for salvation and, and their faith will be so real that they will be willing to die for Jesus. Um, we're not going to be the tribulation saints, but I'd like to live like a tribulation saint today. In other words, I want to be willing to die if necessary for Jesus. I don't want to bow down to Satan's influences today. I don't want to bow down to his temptations, no matter what the cost you know, we need to, you know, take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, deny ourselves. But that's what we see with these people. And I believe it's true for many of us in here today that we want to be light. We want to be salt. We want to be ambassadors for Christ, representing the kingdom of God to the world around us. That's the bottom line. I mean, why are we still here? I hear a lot of Christians say, well, why has God not come back for us? Why has Jesus not come for his bride? Well, he'll come when he comes, but until he does, he wants us to represent him. That's what an ambassador for Christ does. We represent him and his kingdom to a lost and dying world around us. Now, the first part of verse 5, as I just mentioned, should be in parentheses. Notice again it says, but the rest of the dead did not live again, until the thousand years were finished. In other words, the rest of the dead refers to all the unbelievers throughout history. They won't be raised. The only ones raised at the end of the thousand years are unbelievers. We're going to see very clearly only those who are saved get raised before the millennial reign of Christ, including Old Testament saints, including the tribulation saints. But unfortunately, those who are unbelievers, they will end up standing before the great white throne judgment. They will face what is known as the second death. That's referred to at the end of this chapter. The second death leads to the lake of fire. So at the end of verse 5, which says this is the first resurrection, again is referring to all of the believers who are raised to eternal life before the thousand-year reign of Christ. But the second resurrection is for all unbelievers. So there's two resurrections, one for life and one for eternal 
separation or everlasting damnation away from the presence of God. Again, verses 13 and 14 tell us that the second resurrection leads to the lake of fire. So the two differences and the, the main differences of these two resurrections are literally the difference between heaven and hell, life and death. I mean, that's how important it is. Uh, Jesus is the one who defined the differences between the first and second resurrections. Here it is in John 5, starting in verse 28. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. What does that mean, to do good? My good works going to save me? No. Remember when they came to Jesus? What good works should we do that we may work the works of God? He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom the Father has sent. So those who have done good, who receive Jesus by faith to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil, they rejected God's grace, his forgiveness, to the resurrection of condemnation. So that's the basis for these two resurrections that are spoken of in the scriptures. Very different resurrections. One to glory with God, one in uh, that'll be eternal damnation in the lake of fire. Again, how blessed we are to be part of the first resurrection. Now look at verse 6 once again. It says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Again, verse 14 tells us the second death is the lake of fire. So that is not for any of God's people. We're only part of the first resurrection. God's people from the very beginning of time to... The, when Christ returns at his second coming, that they alone will be part of the first resurrection. The first resurrection means they are given everlasting life. Now, the first resurrection, this is an important thing to listen to and, and heed, is first resurrection is in stages. It's not all at once. It comes in stages. Jesus Christ is the first resurrection. He's the first one to rise up with an everlasting body. Uh, Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So if you're in Christ, you're going to be made alive someday. I mean, as far as resurrection bodies. But each one in his own order... So this is where we have different stages. Christ the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. And so Jesus is the ultimate trailblazer. He rose from the dead, he conquered the grave, and so he is the first fruits. But the, the second group that will rise up and receive a resurrection body is the bride, the body of Christ. Uh, at the rapture. This is when we will receive our resurrection bodies. Nobody's received a resurrection body yet except for Jesus Christ. When we die, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, so our spirit goes to be with Jesus, but it's at the rapture. And at the rapture, there's going to be two different groups that are going to receive their resurrection bodies, all part of the body of Christ, but this is what we read, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Again, this only refers to the Lord's church that was born on the day of Pentecost and is completed when this rapture takes place. And here's how Paul describes it. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ. Again, the only place you can be for eternal life is in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Caught up, harpazo, snatched away quickly. So those who have died in Christ will receive their resurrection bodies that much quicker than us. By just a very short amount of time. 
So all dead Christians will be snatched up first, and then if we're still here when the rapture takes place, we will immediately follow them into the presence of the Lord. And so we will all be part of the first resurrection unto eternal life. But as we just saw here, the tribulation saints are also part of the first resurrection. But they're not given their new bodies until the second coming of Christ. So we go up, and then there's seven years, the great tribulation. Christ returns. Those who have rejected the Antichrist, they receive Christ, then they'll be given their resurrection bodies at that time as well which, by the way, is when all the Old Testament saints are raised to eternal life. That's what the, You read the last chapter of Daniel, and you'll see that is when they are raised up after this time of Jacob's trouble, after this time uh, of tribulation on the earth. Then the Old Testament saints are given their resurrection bodies. Again, one way to look at this, uh, the resurrection of the righteous believers, it'll occur in stages, and these stages kind of correspond with the Jewish harvest feasts. Well, not the feast, but the Jewish harvest. Um, I just mentioned Jesus is the first fruits. And, and Paul talks about Jesus being the first fruits. Well, that was the first phase of a Jewish harvest. They would harvest just the first fruits, and it was a holiday. It was a time to rejoice that God's going to bless us. Here, here's the beginning of it. And then you have the general harvest when most of it, you know, all the produce was brought in, but then the third stage was the gleaning after the main harvest, and they would have the gleaning when people would come in and they would glean the edges of the field and bring in the rest of the harvest. And so that's kind of what we see here with Jesus, the first fruits, then the rapture, the main harvest, and then the harvest of the Old Testament saints and those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord. Uh, again, Daniel 12 tells us that after the great tribulation, the time of Israel's trouble, God will raise up his people, and again, those who trusted God's word. That, that's how you're born again. That's how you're saved, is by simply trusting God's revealed word. So people that were not even under the law. So you go before Moses and the law was given, who were righteous? Well, Enoch, he walked with God and was no more. God took him. Job, long before the law. Noah, again, long before the law was given, uh, part of the Old Testament group. Gentiles, not just the Jews, but like Rahab the harlot and Ruth the Moabite woman. They're part of that Old Testament group as well. They're going to be raised up, given resurrection bodies at the second coming of Christ. So again, how blessed we are, how blessed are all of God's people, we have a part in the first resurrection. Again, it says here, over such the second death has no power. In other words, you will never have to fear death. We don't need to fear it now, but we'll never fear death again because Jesus has conquered death. He's conquered the grave. Hebrews 2, look at these verses real quick, verses 14 and 15. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same, he took on a human body, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In other words, we don't have to fear death. Death has no power over us any longer. We, we simply move. You know, I love what Pastor Chuck used to say, because one of these days you're going to read in the newspaper, Pastor Chuck has died, because that's false reporting. I didn't die, I just moved. And that's true for all of us. We're just going to move out of these bodies of flesh, and he'll bring us into his presence, and at the rapture we'll get our resurrection bodies. So as new creations in Christ, when we die, we immediately go into the presence of God. Our body, this physical carcass, will go into the ground. It'll be turned to dust and ashes, but our spirit goes to heaven. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But again, as we see at the end of verse 6 here, all of us who are part of the first resurrection will be priests of God and will rule and reign with Christ 
and we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. I mean, that just blows my mind. Again, my BB brain cannot comprehend this, but it's going to be awesome. And I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but over and over again, in fact, six times in this first section of this chapter, it says, how many years? 1,000 years. 1,000 years. He's going to rule and reign for 1,000 years. And it's amazing how many Christians will say, well, I don't think a 1,000 years means a 1,000 years. It means a 1,000 years. The, the Latin is millianum or millennium. Uh, the Greek is chilios. It just means a 1,000 years. Some of you may have heard of chilion or chilios. It just means we're part of the 1,000 year. That's what we believe the 1,000 year means. A literal rule and reign of Christ for a 1,000 years. I don't know how God can make it any clearer here. And the Bible has a lot to say about what happens on earth during the 1,000 year kingdom age. I mean, the Old Testament prophets wrote about these things. The New Testament prophets and writers wrote about these things. Uh, Jesus spoke about these things. Remember when they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray? You know, you remember what he said there in, in uh, Matthew 6, verse 9. He says, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are praying. That should be our desire. Lord, I want your kingdom to be here on earth. We don't make it happen. It's only going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom on earth. But that is what the millennium is all about. God's kingdom on earth. Look at these scriptures. I, I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, I encourage you to go through the book of Isaiah because it has the most verses that deal with the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, what it's going to be like. I'll just go through some quickly here in Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it shall come to pass in the latter days... That means the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Again, all the nations will come and, you know, just be there where Jesus is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. And again, he'll be ruling and reigning with a rod of iron. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The United Nations has part of that verse over their building in the United Nations. But they're thinking, we're going to do this first. We'll do this. We'll make it happen. Are you kidding me? It's going to get worse and worse as time goes on. Only Jesus Christ can bring this to an end. Isaiah 11 um, look at verse 6. It says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. This is part of the millennial reign of Christ. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. We'll close there. But I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that time. But until then... Again, as bad as it is here, it's going to get worse, especially when the church is removed and the great tribulation takes place and God will pour out his wrath and judgment. You don't have to be part of that. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, ask him to come into your life. Ask him to you know, forgive you of all the sins you've committed. Ask him to wash you clean 
and receive him as your Lord and Savior, and he will because he loves you, and he doesn't want you to go through that time of judgment and wrath. He wants you to be with him and to walk with him both now on into glory. Amen.